All right, in your scriptures this evening, let's continue with our study for just for as a refresher. We want to uh, go to Ephesians in chapter 6, Ephesians chapter 6, and, and read the verses there from uh, 1 through 9. It's kind of establishing a platform that, um, to begin with, and then we'll, we'll move from there to other texts of scripture. So as we look at uh, this study, the, the foundations, the Ten Commandments, but primarily this one in particular, the Fifth Commandment, honor your father and your mother, as the, the, uh, the foundation for an ordered society. It says, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and thy mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long on the earth. And you fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh, not with fear and trembling, in singleness of your heart as unto Christ, not with eye service as men pleasers, but as the servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, with good will, doing service as to the Lord, not to men. Knowing that whatsoever good thing any man does, the same shall be received of the Lord, whether he be bond or free. And you masters, do the same things unto them, forbearing threatenings, knowing that your master also is in heaven. There is neither respect of persons with him. Father, we pray that you would unfold and unpackage the words tonight and uh, bring it home to us today in the times in which we live to grant us wisdom and understanding into the depths and the knowledge and the secret uh, wisdom of God that is there so that we can see how these principles apply to our lives, our duty and responsibility when it comes to employment, to government, to church, to home, and so much more. Lead us and guide us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I wanted to do a little bit of review and just to say that the computer absolutely just shut down this morning. I I thought it was a dead battery, but it was not. So for whatever reason it decided it was going to shut off, Uh, I think the people that were online were able to see it because a backup computer is up there uh, still presenting the slides. Now, speaking of backup, I have a backup plan in case this ever happens again. I'm going to back up and leave. That'll be the, the height of frustration, so there is a backup plan. <laughs> but I just wanted to review a little bit, the foundation for the church. We look at the fifth commandment. It's not just kids do what mom and dad tell you, but the implications, the foundational truths that are there for us. And so to bring that leadership that uh, the, uh, the fact that there, there are pastors and then there are people to help uh, all generations understand that God gave pastors and teachers and they serve a purpose. So he sets up a hierarchy in the church. There's an order of authority that is in there. And this is just one of the passages that, that bring this out. The other would be to help us understand that it's not just the pastors, but also at another level, there are those that are older than whatever age. So the text doesn't tell us in exclu- uh, explicitly the age of an elder, but it implies to us that he's been around for a while. In, uh, in the Old Testament, he would be identified as the, the gray-haired individual. Um, Proverbs and Ecclesiastes talk about the silver hair, which is equivalent to uh, age and wisdom. So uh, we would understand it to say that, but the elder, the older people, by all people, are to be rendered respect and to be treated as fathers. So it tells us something of age and experience. And the younger men, that would be those that, if we want to assign age groups, let's just say we're going to use the magic number of 62 and above, who maybe would qualify as an elder, and anybody below that are not to be treated necessarily as the, the elder of wisdom, but rather as, as younger men 
as brethren. So that, that age bracket could be anywhere from uh, uh, 20 to 40, something like that. But ladies also re- deserve respect, the elder women as mothers. So you see the same model, children obey your parents, a father and a mother, as it enters into the church. There are people that are not your biological parents, but they serve and they act as a role. They, they carry out that same practice and the same mentality. So the younger as sisters with all purity. And, and then we also noted that there is a distinction between widows that are in need and widows that can be supported by family members. And so if a, any man of the faith of the church have dependent widows, they lost their husband, let them be taken care of so that the church doesn't have to have that responsibility. It's not the church's responsibility. The church's responsibility that it may relieve those that are certainly indeed widows 60 years of age or over. So uh, this is a model that uh, that God built for the church. It has responsibility toward uh, widows and, and and. in that responsibility, it's, there is that of the, of the immediate family, and then there is also that of the church itself. And then there's this text that speaks about having those that rule over you within the church submit yourself. So again, it's a presentation of an authority structure. And even in that, it says there's reason for that. Like a boss, an employer, really, there are some good ones. But then there are those that they just want to see productivity so that the coffers can be filled. The profit margin is high. Pastoral work is not that way. We're not interested in the budget and necessarily trying to inflate it or make it. I get no profit margin out of it, but rather pastors are in a position of watching out for your souls as they must give account. So this sermon, I have to answer for this sermon. I have to answer for all the preaching that I do. I have to answer to was it, was it for my benefit or your benefit? Every preacher has to have that in mind, that sermon presentation, preparation, and the preaching of the Word is designed in such a way that it's for the watch care of the individuals that are out there enter into ministry of the Holy Spirit to help and to aid in that, that they may do it with joy, not with grief, for that is unprofitable for the entire congregation. So, again, the structure that is there, the hierarchy, so we take away from that the fact that the fifth commandment establishes the home foundationally as the learning center for worshiping the one true God, commandments one through four. We do that by training an example, Deuteronomy chapter five, Deuteronomy chapter six. As they walk around, dad shows them how to do business. They have scripture memorization. They have the Word of God in Hebrew posted at certain points. And so it was a, a life that was saturated with a biblical worldview. And the intent was to have their hearts go upward towards God. The fifth commandment by means of parents establishes the foundation of the biblical authority and, and that of submission in the local church. So that had to do with the foundation for the church. So far, Exodus and then we looked at the two passages that are there in uh, Ephesians. So this, this picture, this word picture I gave to you this morning, is to help us get a visual of when we talk about uh, the, the fifth commandment as a foundation. All of these institutions rest on the acknowledgement and the honoring of that commandment. The activity that happens there, the intent and the design of the commandment is meant that it will support the home, worship toward God, the local church, employer, industry, laws, government, and then the nation. So it, it cannot be taken lightly. It's not one that can be just extracted from our livelihood. As a matter of fact, when you think about Uh, legislation and activity and uh, special interest groups that are doing everything that they can to undermine and dissolve dissolve the family unit, whether or not it's heterosexual relationships or that of uh, the abortion of infants, 
Uh, the school knows better than you do as a parent. The doctors now know better than what you do. The psychologist knows far more than what you do because we as parents, we do not have enough degrees at the end of our name to burn paper, so therefore we are ignorant. And so in society, there's a, there is a march. There, there is, is a drive. It's an all-out warfare. Now we know who is behind this. Only Satan realizes and understands that when, if, when the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? I think that is going to be his memory verse. Destroy the foundation. What will the church do then? What will society do? How will governments exist? How will anything exist? If I can just take the fifth commandment, children, obey your parents. If I can just move that out and have, never have it taught or explained or preached, he can see that the domino effect would just be phenomenal. It would give Satan everything that he would hope to do. The final destruction of a nation, of the churches, of the family, of education, of local law enforcement, et cetera, et cetera. So all of these things are there. Now, what I did, if, if, if you, I'm sure nobody drew this chart out, but I rearranged the last three and, uh, from employee, employer uh, on, and I, I just put them more of a, it's a sequential order as, as part of the uh, sermon here for tonight. So let's just briefly take into consideration the wisdom of the fifth commandment. It's a reiteration of what I've already been saying, but here we have it. If we do not have clear lines of authority to which we are to submit, there will be anarchy. Take that into consideration. Wherever there is anarchy, you lack clear lines of authority. Now, if you're not sure how that worked, all you have to do is think of Oregon, think of Michigan, Minnesota, all those places where anarchy through a movement of Black Lives Matter and all of the destruction that took place. There was no, as locusts, they have no guide or ruler. They had a philosophy and a worldview, but there was no one particular king uh, individual that ever reported to. And so we find ourselves in that, as in Judges chapter 17, verse 6, in those days there was no king in Israel, but every man did that which was right in his own eyes. There was nobody there to establish the boundary lines. There was nobody there to give us the clear lines of authority. So authority is not something that is to be despised. We may shudder at the idea of an overreaching authority, authoritarian, or a dictatorship, but God created it, and in his infinite wisdom, he knew that there would be problems, and the problems are going to be from the subordinates. The problems are also going to be from those that are in those positions of authority. So as we go through this, we'll understand that both are tempered. If there is anarchy, then tyranny will be close behind. It happens all the time, that um, because after a while with, with anarchy, somebody like the society says, we just can't continue this way. Somebody's got to take over. And so through, through fight and bloodshed and elections and all sort of thing, a tyrant then steps up to the throne. And he rules with an iron hand. At the same time, authority must be tempered uh, by the duty rulers have to serve and to defend. That is the objectors of the rulers. You can see this in the Old Testament, the assignment that was given to kings. Even in our day, even in law enforcement, you, you see to serve and to uh, defend on the side of uh, the cars, of patrol cars. And so that's another way of saying, listen, we have the duty to serve. Jesus presented the, uh, the model for servanthood for leadership in Matthew chapter 20 and verse 20. That's easy to remember. It's 2020 vision on leadership, Matthew 2020. And so he, 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 here's, the, here's the way it works. You have your generals, and you have your captains, you have your lieutenants, you have your sergeants, and everybody does what the guy above them told them to do. But then he says, I'm going to turn it all upside down. Not so among you. If any man will be your leader, any man will be your chief, let him first be your servant. So the authority of, let's say, the pastor or the parent or a government has to be that 
that it recognizes there's a servanthood that is there if we want to have an effective ministry, effective business, or an effective government. So we have authority, but the scriptures temper that with particular duties, admonitions, and prohibitions. So just so we get some idea of the value and the importance of the Exodus 20 and verse 12 text. Who rules? This is a very simple word picture diagram. When nobody rules, you have anarchy. When you have one person ruling, you have monarchy or dictatorship or tyranny. Tyranny. And so when you get to just a few, so we have like four or five people, you have oligarchy. And then when all people rule, you have what is called a democracy. We have a modified version of that, you will, with a, a representative form of government. So the Founding Fathers, they knew the disastrous consequences of any one of these. So we, we don't have a democracy in the United States. We have what is called a Republican form of government. However, at least it is on paper. I think there are times when we have the few or the democracy, which is the popular vote, the popular opinion, but it's not necessarily the popular vote of the nation itself. But nevertheless, you get to see these models. When biblical principles of the fifth commandment are applied and maintained and defended, then we need not worry about the none, the one, the few, or the all. As a matter of fact, when you stop to think about it, the local church is none of these. We are, it's not an anarchy because the Bible prohibits a pastor with ruling with iron fist authority. It's not a monarchy or a, a dictatorship. Uh, by anarchy, it's not the church is constantly in, in an uprising. Uh, it's not a monarchy. There's not just a handful of us, nor is it a democracy. We, most of Baptist churches practice what is called congregational rule. It takes into consideration that if there's going to be measures or direction or spending or what have you, policy, it goes before the congregation for a vote. And the vote is a majority by, most of the time, 66%, or at least two-thirds. So that is there. Uh, but even in that, what is oftentimes discussed and voted on falls under a higher authority of the Scriptures, which set the parameters as to what we want to do. So anything from putting up a building to an outreach to the methodology or to a uh, the, the sermon topics, all of that is carefully uh, scrutinized by the Word of God. So even a congregational form of government, even though it appears as though the, the congregation is ruling and rendering judgment, it starts with the, shall we say, the clergy before it gets the laity, and, the, and both parties are under the accountability before God uh, as to any decisions that are going to be brought before the floor for a vote. So, thinking about the foundation for the home, the text, Exodus 20, verse 12, as we move to the home, that's where uh, worldview, worship toward God, loving God, loving your neighbor is established in the home. We moved the atmosphere of the home into the church, where uh, children begin to understand it's not just mom and dad. I've learned how to hear somebody give me instructions, maybe even say, this is what you can do or what you can't do. This is what I want you to do. So, and, and seeing how there is such a thing as authority and then subordinates. So that happens in the church. It's a perfect, it's a great place to be able to learn this. At the same time, if there is a lack of practice and instruction of Exodus 20, 12 at home, then the structure of the church will be equally feeble. So we have to maintain strength and integrity and a careful following of the precepts and the principles of the, of the text itself. So then we go to industry. Um, we have the little gearbox, which means things are being invented. Then you have the Wi-Fi symbol, because I think that symbolizes probably where we're at in our day. Everything is technology-based. And then there's always the guy that's going to carry the screwdriver and a wrench. I love it. <laughs> he still has a job. But what that tells us, it's just an icon. It's a three-dimensional picture that says, 
this is where we build things. This is, this is what a society uh, pretty much uh, rests upon. We are sustained by industry, manufacturing, production. So when I use those words, we're looking at outcomes. We're looking at the gross national product. But within the context of any business that is going to create the GMP, what do you have? You have perhaps a board of directors that entails the different company positions. Ford, for example, in Kentucky and, uh, and Chevrolet up in Michigan and these different places, uh, all of these fall under then management systems. And those management systems will have presidents and CEOs and they will have supervisors clear down to the level that there will be somebody supervising those that sweep the floor. And so there will be this kind of, of uh, superiority, management, the boss, and everybody, somebody's going to fall under somebody else's jurisdiction. So when we take a look at that, we would find in Ephesians chapter 6, Hebrews chapter 13, uh, the, these, on that side of the screen, each one of these institutions are called upon to be submissive to those that are authority over them. Why? Well, if you don't, somebody may decide, I'm not coming into work today. And so while well, they're trying to manufacture computers, and the guy that's installing hard drives is, just says, you know what, a no-show. He doesn't even call in. Why? Because he doesn't feel like it. Because I'm going to do that which is right in my own eyes. So now we've got a whole stack of computers over here waiting for the hard drive to be installed. Why? Because Joe decided he was going to take his day off. Now, if Joe's left to do that and there's no consequence for that, then everybody else, what are they going to do? Hey, that's pretty cool. I'm just going to stay home, go to the beach today. Unless there's some kind of authority that says you've got to report for work. You have to show up and be on duty. Otherwise, we're going to dock your pay. You won't get paid. You might even put your job at risk. So those parameters, those guidelines, Clear lines of authority have to be in place if we're going to see production in industry, even as to what happens on the floor. The guy, people have to do their job and their job alone, not be interfering with somebody else's. So in each one of these texts, the Hebrews text uh, teaches us that uh, he's accountable. The pastor is accountable to God. He watches for the souls, must give a tell. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 5 to 9, talk about the employer the employee, so these all fall under the category of that of submission. Guess what? The same people. So not only do you have the laborers over on the left side of the screen, yes, over on the left side of the screen, but you also have now those officers, those leaders that are in a position of authority, and they're called upon Fathers, provoke not your children to wrath. So his authority is tempered with instruction from God. That same model of temperament and, and uh, setting the guidelines that is found there finds its way throughout the pages of Scripture where you see that there is the authority and then the subordinate. That each are given instructions as to how far they can operate and what the, uh, the guidelines, the parameters are in each one. So for the fathers, or as in the first four verses of 6, 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 2 to 4, I have that marked. We read these words in 1 Peter 5, verses 2 to 4. And Peter writes to the congregation there and says this, Feed the flock of God, speaking to pastors of God, which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, not, but willingly nor for the sake of profit and money, but of a ready mind, neither being lords over God's heritage. So the church is not my vineyard. This is actually being in a position to maintain, to take care of, to watch over this flock as an example, not being lords. So the First Peter 5, 2-4 Text gives the instruction, and the chief shepherd, there's the accountability, shall appear, you will receive a crown of glory that fades not away for honest effort and not being a tyrant or a dictator or an oligarchy with me and the deacons. We're going to tell you all what to do. That's out. And so here we have submission, 
we have then the, uh, the text of Scripture that addresses it. By the way, that's not the only one. And so even uh, the bosses, the employers are given instructions on how to manage industry and, uh, and employment employees. All sitting on those rocks at the bottom of the screen, honor and obey your father and your mother. Why? Because it establishes what is necessary to maintain good, solid society in those institutions. We get to the last one here this evening, the foundation for government and for nation. As we talk about that, we begin to realize quickly this, this text is found in 1 Peter chapter 2, and it begins at verse 13. He says, Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king as supreme, or to the governors, or as unto them that are sent by him, Elio, for the punishment of evildoers, and for the praise of those that do well. For so is the will of God, that with well-doing you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. It's simply telling us this. Romans chapter 13, we also have an expansion of the same idea. God has established government and local law that is there for a reason. And it's to maintain order in society. So, now we go and we look at what's happening in the news. We want to defund police departments. We want to uh, do anything that we can that removes the authority and the teeth out of law enforcement. We want to be able to remove authority from governors at the state level by legislation at the federal level through the judicial system. So now everything is being used and abused. Why is that? Well, because if we can, if we can remove all of those good things, it allows then the dictatorship, the anarchy, or excuse me, the tyranny and the oligarchy to be able to get into place. So all of that, when you think about it, sits on Exodus chapter 20 and verse 12. So in closing, let's just take into consideration uh, one or two thoughts that we can use uh, by way of application. Knowing this, knowing this, that everything, if there's going to have, be stability and if there is going to be uh, a any kind of order, how important is it then uh, that when we have the possibility to affect government in the defense of the family, that's where, as individuals, not only as Christians do we pray to that end, and as, as believers, uh, we want to be able to teach parents how to raise their children and do all of that right, not so that they sit well and pretty in church, because the future of a nation depends on it. That's how crucial this really is. And that's why I've taken the time to, to build on this, to help us understand uh, that a superficial view of the passage would be, now the kids grew up, they really are doing a great job, they're going somewhere in life, et cetera, et cetera, and, and, and so pastor's going to hand out books, how to have a good family, and all that kind of stuff. And that's all important. I'm not mocking that. But what really matters is when we look down through the, the tunnel of time, and we understand that if this commandment, number five, is not honored at its grassroots level, and if, if it is not practiced and enforced and defended, if we don't defend it, then we can look forward to nothing but an implosion and a collapse and a destruction of all the institutions of society. They just will not exist. Remember, kids died in Israel, teenagers probably, because they argued with their parents and called them bad names and blasphemed God. And why is that? Because God knew that if the young generation, if you had rebellious children, that was going to end up being the rebellion of the nation. The very foundation of government, which was found in the headship of the family and the tribal leaders that created the nation, once they were rendered disrespect and nobody cared without consequence, then the nation of Israel would no longer be that nation that would rise and shine unlike any other nation of the world. And the same thing is true.
for ourselves in the United States. So when there, there are organizations that work for us in places in Washington, D.C., and uh, you, you have the American Family Association, there is a Christian uh, Family, the Christian Family Association with, with Tony Verdega, and they, they invest huge amounts of time and money being at Tallahassee in legislation to either defend particular bills or to make sure that there are bills that are offensive and detrimental to the family unit and, and sexuality and all this kind of thing. They work hard at this. We support them, what is it, Mike, at the 300 a year, I think is what we send, so they are, they are our local mission to us to be able to make sure that this text of Scripture is upheld in the best way that we can. So we, in one sense, we're kind of limited to what we can do, but at yet and another, there are representative people, groups, that are very effectual and powerful. Um, you have, um, there's a family rights organization. Do you remember which one it is? That's, oftentimes I'll see that on the internet also. And they work separately from Christian Family Association, but they also are very instrumental in the protection of family values and the family unit and uh, what's happening inside the home. All right, so uh, in the end, I hope it was informative. My objective was to help us to see the, the far-reaching effects of one passage of Scripture out of the Old Testament, how it speaks volumes to uh, the, the, the world in which we live today, mainly the institutions of society, which pretty much govern and affect our very, the very lives in which we live. So, Father, thank you that in your wisdom, that it goes far above that which we would ever ask or think, you've created uh, the, the very family unit, and in it, Lord, is to help teach young people and us. We are products of that, of what it is to have authority in our lives. It's not just so somebody can push us around, but rather so that we can see peace and harmony the expansion, the preaching of the gospel, the word of God. As we pray for the leaders over us that the gospel may have free course so that we can enjoy the benefits of industry and invention because there was freedom, because there was a management system that allowed for productivity and uh, research and development. All of that sits upon this verse. Help us in whatever way, way that we can to proclaim it, to defend it, and to make it effective. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.